Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Good evening, Barbadians and all who are here in our voices. Um, let me thank you for joining us. And let me say that in this room, I have obviously a number of ministerial colleagues at the head table with me, the Honorable Attorney General, Dale Marshall, and the Honorable Minister of Health, the Honorable Jeffrey Bostick, um, Dr. Greenwich, who is our one of our consultants, economic advisors, who was seconded from um, Washington to work with us for the last two years, and I think Barbadians have gotten accustomed to his voice recently. Um, the COVID-19 czar, but I also have a number of other ministers in the audience, Minister of Labor, Minister um, Colin Jordan, Minister in the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Investment, Minister Cattle, Minister in the Ministry of Finance, Minister Strawn, and of course the Governor of the Central Bank. Um, more importantly, I also have with me the members and leaders of a number of unions. We've just come out of another one of many meetings this week, and I really want to start this evening by thanking all, not just my ministerial colleagues, not just the union leaders, but the members of the private sector who are not here, members of the public service who have worked um, continuously to get us to this point over the course of the last two weeks. It's really been a, a long journey trying to get a number of things correct. This evening, we've called this press conference to address two basic matters. One, to update you with where we are with um, what we have come to call a national meeting term, but which you will now learn has a new acronym that has come as a result of what I call the genius of Barbadian ingenuity by us being able to take a plan and to make it better and stronger and fitter and more capable of meeting the needs of all Barbadians. And I want to thank formally the labor movement, um, Barbados Workers Union, National Union of Public Workers, SETUSAB, of course, um, the Barbados Police Association, the Barbados Union of Teachers, the Barbados Fire Service Association, the Barbados Air Traffic Control Association, the Barbados Association of Public Primary um, School Principals, um, and the Association of Secondary Principals, that's APS and BAPS. Um, <laughs> And I think I called the Barbados Union of Teachers already. The Barbados Nurses Association, the Barbados Association of Medical Practitioners, the Nurses Association and Aid Association of Barbados, and the Sugar Industry, um, CISA, which are the workers within the sugar industry. Um, and I want to thank everybody. I've listed them not because we've come to a final point of agreement, but because on this journey, we have been walking and working together to perfect something that will work for the country, that will work for the workers, that will work for ordinary Barbadians and credit unions who are interested in savings. And I think we have come up with something that can probably be described as a boss move that is a win-win. Um, you will hear from Dr. Greenwich that the acronym of the program is, in fact, BOSS because it is called the Barbados Optional Savings Scheme. The program is intended to be able to benefit, as I said, the needs of government, which is that we need above the line to be able to recast some of our recurring expenditure and to put in place of it additional capital expenditure so that we can ha undertake aggressively a number of projects that will allow us to be able to increase the number of persons who are working in the country. As of today, um, we had 41,836 unemployment benefit claims. Um, I think I can say if there is good news, it is that it is not increasing at the rate at which it was increasing before. If there is good news, it is that there are at least 500 persons who have gone back um, to their substantive work and not at the um, not claiming the unemployment benefit anymore. 
Um, when we come to the second part of the press conference, I'll give you more details about the, what we've paid out, etc. But for this point in time, we believe that if we can repurpose close to $100 million of recurring expenditure to capital works, that there will be a greater multiplier effect that will allow more Barbadians to be able to work, whether it is in the construction of roads or water mains or buildings that are sick buildings being refurbished or schools that need to be repaired or whether it is in cleaning up the country from um, the sides of the road to the lots that you heard me speak about and the gullies, um, the beaches, um, derelict buildings, whether it is the <clears throat> digitization of government's records and we now have the loan for that as we told you and therefore the ability to execute a little quicker is something that we would want to have the ability to do or whether it is in retraining or whether it is in expanded agricultural production, um, being able to meet the public good needs of water and improve the quality and nature of our soils to be able to enhance food production. So those capital projects, we believe, will lead to additional jobs and employment. And therefore, it allows us to take an approach in this boss move, in the routine of really what is an optional national meeting turn. It's not compulsory, it's optional. Um, but the government's needs are met and the workers' needs are met. And the needs of anybody interested in saving, be they individuals or credit unions outside of the government or other institutions, insurance companies, banks, etc., um, their needs can be met. I do not believe that I can explain it as well to you as Dr. Greenwich, who has perfected the art of explaining complex matters in a way that my constituents can understand at the very basic level. Because first and foremost, um, and we're proud of him, he's a Bajan. And um, yesterday I had to say about another distinguished Barbadian who died, that he was Bajan by name and nature, because with a nickname like Brugadong, he would have to be a Bajan. Um, we haven't given Dr. Greenwich a nickname yet, but I'm sure we can find one by the end of this process. Dr. Greenwich? And for the members of the media um, and, and the others, I think he may be using an element of a presentation, so I'll just direct your attention to that. Thank you, Prime Minister. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As the Prime Minister indicated, I will just take you through the basic elements and give you an outline of the program, um, which we are calling the Barbados Optional Savings Scheme. Now, let me start out by indicating, as the Prime Minister have mentioned, alluded to, why now? Why do we do this right now? What's the motivation? So first, on one hand, prior to COVID, we were expect, we have a projection for what we expect to happen to the government revenues. And along came COVID and decimated government revenues, especially anything that relates or relies on tourism activity. And we projecting the economic team that we will lose probably close to 500 million, between 450, 450 million to 500 million in government revenues. And that's the current working scenario. It could be worse, but that's it. So on the revenue side, we're losing a considerable amount of revenues we're projected to lose. At the same time, government had responded to the COVID, no, just. by stepping up expenditure in key areas, particularly we're all familiar with the work done in terms of outfitting the various um, quarantine facilities, buying medical supplies, etc. And in the two speeches the Prime Minister would have presented in terms of budget speeches, you will have seen about $45 million put aside in a household survival program. I won't go through it there, it's there money put aside to help businesses survive through the COVID. And so we have repurposed, government repurposed expenditures in many areas to try to accommodate for the loss in revenues, but while still keeping the economy at least going while we, try, we expect it to recover as the jobs and um, tourism come back. But given now the fact that you see the unemployment rising and jobs are increasing, this program is designed in order to help us further absorb some labor. 
The idea is to repurpose some expenditures from the current expenditure from the wage bill into capital that will help to push the capital program in key areas which includes, for example, improving the uh, grace of schools and roads work, environmental cleanup, sanitation programs, programs that we can bring forward in the capital side that do not directly relate to tourism, thereby mopping up some of the excess unemployment that is we currently seeing. So this program, the BOSS program, is designed to achieve two things. On one hand, it helps on the fiscal because, and not to get too technical now, but simply if our fiscal record it as a cash, so whatever we pay as wages, if we can pay a portion of that in bonds, we save it and push that into capital, and capital expenditure, economic wisdom suggests, investing in that grows the economy, at the same time we are stopping and grow. Um, 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 jobs. The other benefit, a dual purpose of this program is that you, you maintain employment in the public sector at, at the current pace as it is now. So you can repurpose but without shedding jobs. So let me get into the program. Um, and just to give you just again an overview, it, the first truth is that there's no workers salaries are not cut. So whatever worker net salary is after taxes and insurance and, and NIS is taken out, are taken out, it remains the same. So if the, but if the worker takes, needs to take home that amount, NIS must minus and taxes, that amount that goes in bank account, the worker still gets the same amount. But this time we are saying we give you the majority in cash and the recorder above in the fiscal, and we give you a small portion. I will show you the amounts, say 10% in a bond. That I don't record as an expenditure, I record as debt. And therefore, that extra space, I, we can then repurpose towards capital. And so the worker is getting the same amount. Now, what about this bond? Is it attractive? The bond that we've come up with is a four-year bond. So the, you, it is four years. It pays an annual interest of 5%, which in this current environment, here, regionally, internationally, is a very good interest rate. Um, most of our debt is in, re, in that region. 5%, it pays, not only you don't have to wait till five years because it pays interest every six months. So the, you, the worker in, in who is investing in the bond is receiving some income through the period. In addition, to even make it even more attractive, we have with, we have with the withholding tax on the interest earned. Usually if you invest in any instrument, put your money in bank or any shares or anything, you pay a withholding tax. That is also waves, so you don't have to worry about that. It's fully tradable because by design, this is an 18-month program, and the worker in month one, let's say we start in July, will have, say, 90% in cash and a 10% and a 10% of his salary in a bond. And in August, the same thing, that's two bonds. In September, same thing, three bonds. So at the end of an 18-month period, the worker has 18 bonds, so he can trade any PC wants at any point in time. Sell bond, bond number two that I got earlier or bond number 10. Or, so it's fully tradable depending on the worker's needs. So, and indeed, because we've been working on the other side, the demand side, with the credit unions, insurance companies, financial institutions, and even general, any corporate, any person, individual, because the attractive nature we want to buy, we have a mechanism where they can express the interest via the central bank and rest stand right to mop up. So it's fully tradable. The other thing, and I just give you the broad overviews, is that just as we had the last debt restructuring, saving bonds were protected, they were not restructured, these bonds will carry that feature. These will be immune from restructuring. Now, just a quick, not that we expect that we will be restructuring again, because I must say, one, when we restructured the last um, debt, which was about 11, 12 billion, built into that was the fact that if we miss an external debt payment, if we miss two IMF or three IMF um, reviews, or if we had to restructure, all of that have to be paid back. And that's a month, a, month, a, month, a large amount of savings that we will start to pay back. What happened? But more importantly, the fundamentals of the Barbados economy has not changed. They are fundamentally on track. We fixed the debt problem, the debt problem which was a high debt uh, uh, problem we found. That's a fundamental which in economics sometimes are referred to as the uh, four um, horsemen of the apocalypse. One, high debt, that is fake, debt is on a stable trajectory and downward. Two, reserves, which was almost absent, that apocalypse horseman has been fixed. We have a reserves close to above 20 weeks of import cover. 
And I still say we are about to go to IMF board on the 3rd of June, and, after, and once that is approved, we will have another disbursement of 49 million under the normal program, US million, and at the same time, we get an additional nine, 90 million US dollars because of the COVID to help us respond to it. Many countries in Caribbean are also going on a different arrangement. So that gives another 140 million dollars in reserves in, on by the 3rd of June that will add to it. So we, 280 Barbados, thank you, Prime Minister. Uh -huh. I was quoting US. And that, so we fixed the reserve problem. Uh, we fixed the fiscal previous to the program. We have fiscal deficits averaging 7%. We are now running primary fiscal primary surplus, which means that our fiscal accounts in order. We pay down from one point, we had about $1.9 billion in the rears. And after setting off into rears, we have about $1.2 billion to work with. We now just north of south of 200 million so you pay it down so the fiscal income so that is a third fundamental and now we've been working on growth so with the fundamentals in check it means we once we get to over this covid period the coming and we prepare and we don't go and do something cr crazy then we'll be able to pick back up so there's no chance i don't want anybody to think that i'm saying we're going to restructure all right so those are the features of the bond now how it will work is that and i just put this table as an example to illustrate the amounts that come out of the salary to go into the bond. We are saying, first of all, we recognize that persons that are earning less income, the lower income, um, would like you to spend more of that income on their normal monthly um, ex expansion needs, or let you to have enough to save. So we are not going to put any, their amount we paid, full salary, in cash. However, they have been opting to say, give me, because of some reason I have a bit more change, maybe you are not in the stage you're paying mortgage, give me an extra $200 of my net salary in a bond, and we will accommodate that. Um, in the, that with persons, 36,000 net income would mean a person earning about less than 3,000 a month. The next band is between 36 and 50,000. That is a person earning between 3,000 and 4,166 dollars a month. That person will get 93% of their salary in cash and 7% in a bond. If they, want. if they want. You can opt in to say whether I don't want no, the bond, I, I need my cash now. It's my money, I want it right now, I got some expenses. And immediately before you get it on payday, that bond will be converted into cash and they will get it in their bank account. So they work with the same amount. And, and I won't go through mechanism what happens so now, but that is how it will work. They may say, I want more. For some reason, I want more than 7%, and there you will accommodate that also. Now, and then the other band is between 50000 and 100000 which is $4,166 and $8,133 um, a month. They, they will get 88% of their salary in cash and 12% in a bond. Again, they may opt in for more, less, none. That will be accommodated. In other words, they, they will get convert and say in their bank account before the time, on the, before pay there. And finally, the last band, over 100,000 per year, which is um, $8,133 per month, be 70%, 83% in cash, and 17% in a bond. And they can, again, opt in or out for more than that. Now, for, I know many economists are within earshot of my voice will, will try to analyze, but how is that helping? Let me reiterate it one more time. Last year, for example, on the central government alone, our wage bill was 8 million, 800 million and six, 806 million. That is cash. Our fiscal accounts are recorded as cash. So if everybody will share the employment, get me no employment share. If we pay that again this year, we expect a similar amount in cash. However, if, I, if we are able to pay a worker 90% of that in cash and 10% in bond, because the fiscal is recorded on a cash basis, the 90% is recorded as a wage bill, the 10% is recorded as a debt. This means I have that extra 10 sp um, uh, percent space because I put it as debt. Now I have it, I have it it's not expansion, I can take it and channel it into productive activities that will help me stimulate growth, which is good because then I can mop up employment and our friends and neighbors get work. So that's how I save on your fiscal. And I'm avoiding another question too, because a person might say, why not let the private sector just buy? It's not because private sector buying 
it's good, but not for this purpose because government don't pay a private sector wages. So we don't save anything by private sector paying. The private sector can pay a role by if a worker wants to sell his bond. And a seamless transaction will happen through the central bank. Credit unions, corporates, individuals with access can go ahead and buy that. So that being said, let me just go and show one, two examples. And then, oh my gosh. I lose my PowerPoint for that, but OK. Just bear with me. So in terms of examples, and, um, I, and by the way, it is why we call it the Barbados Optional Safety Scheme, because workers can choose to have the, all their money in cash, or a larger proportion in bond that we have contemplated, a smaller proportion, any amount. Because at any day, what matters is how we are recording on the fiscal. So it's truly optional. And we are, we are working with Central Bank and our partners to make sure that even after you get the bond, it can easily be traded. Now let me give you an example why this is a really a win-win for everyone. If, assume a person net take home pay is $3,397.09, because that person annually was about 48. Um, that means that that person will get 93% of their income in cash and the other 7%. That means 237% in bonds and 93% in cash. So from the government treasury, they will get a check for 93 in their account, and they have a bond that is at the central bank. Before payday day, because they, indi they can indicate, I don't want the bond. And by payday, they will see in their account the cash central bank would immediately convert it into cash by finding a buyer, buyer which is already available and, uh, and central bank is about to drop and they have their cash. They may want more, they may want less, so it's fully convert. but what I want to point out is the savings component of it. That person will have saved the $237.80 in, let's say we start in July, in July. In August, another piece, that's two bonds going to Central Bank. In September, another 237.80 goes into Central Bank. By the end of 18 months, they will have 18 individual bonds, and remember I said that improves tradability, that goes into their bond account. They can trade any time. If they had kept all in that account, they will earn 800, they will have a total of $4,280.33 in their bond account, savings, and they will have earned interest over the four-year period of $856.03 and seven cents. Now, fast is fast. That's interest earned. That's a return. If you put that same money in the bank, given or any institution, given the average rate of 0 0.15, not that a crime, no institution is the reality situation, you will come out probably with only $25 in interest. And I ain't talk about any bank charges or anything. It makes good sense. It's a no-brainer in terms of it makes investment sense. And I have other examples to show how it can work. But beyond that, the main point is that this then ob achieved the objective. It allows, on one hand, the government to repurpose that proportion that is paid in bonds into capital projects to stimulate growth, etc. And on the other hand, it protects the workers because there's no shedding of labor, and the worker gets his or her cash all, all, all in hand. The only issue would be liquidity. I want my money now. And we have solved that problem by ensuring that the bonds are fully tradable, that we have established a market that it can be traded, and even before, before they get their salary, they can get it converted, no cost, if it's done on that day. Um, and that's not, n the other point is that that's not the only way they can trade. They can get their bonds. A worker may take his bond and two months later decide, well, I have certain amounts of bonds in my account, maybe 5,000. Something happened, I need it now. Again, they just can easily convert all or how much they want. Individuals who are not in the private and public sector who wants to buy can register with this central bank and a portal is being developed and indicate how much they would like to buy at any point in time. And therefore, that's a way that if you have a little money in the mattress or wherever, you can easily pick it up. A worker to take his bond to credit union, we're working in credit unions, and your credit union will be more than happy, I believe, to be able to take that up because they get to invest in a good product, their, their uh, revenues improve, their profits improve, the, the worker who is a member of the credit union, dividends get paid, win-win for everybody. You might even know somebody, a neighbor, aunt, uncle who, who, who wants to buy a bond, you have it. 
bill slips first state that, and we are looking at amending essential by laws uh, to make sure that trading happens, but that can be done. So you're, you are not restricted in any, as I heard um, by Mr. earlier, is it having cash in back of your, your pocket to just, you can do what you want with it. So it solves those dual purposes. Um, again, there's m the details we are working out, but that's a favor of what it stands, what it looks like. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, sir. Um, I said earlier that it is a benefit for government, it is a benefit for the workers, it is a benefit for the credit unions and other Bajans or institutions who want to save. But as you can also see, it is going to be a benefit for those without a job today, but who can find jobs within the different sectors that will be the subject of an aggressive capital works program. So that we really are our brothers and sisters keeper but at the same time, we are not harming the individual by ensuring that there will be a ready market on the day before your salary is paid for you to decide whether you want to opt in or opt out, whether you want to opt in fully or partially. You may have, for example, you say, look, I love this 5% because the bank is paying me 0.01 or 0.1, depending on which bank you're at. And the bottom line is that if you had $10,000 in a bank over the period of time of the 18 months or you accumulated it, you would be getting anywhere between $1 and $10 in interest per year. Whereas with this scheme, you'd get $500. So that the disparity, and I'm asking the media because in all of this, this is a conversation with Barbadians that we will have, but predominantly the public sector workers. Against that background, and you'll understand why once I make some announcements with relation to COVID, there will be some larger meetings next week um, with public sector workers. And we, um, we're conscious that Monday is a bank holiday. So on Tuesday and Wednesday, we will probably do three sessions on each day. So we reckon two to three hours for each session. And we reckon that if we go to the gymnasium, which normally will hold 4,500, um, 4,600, that if we put 1,000 people or 1,100 people in there, given the densities that I'm going to, in fact, that's below the density that we're going to announce soon for churches and for others, um, that we would be able to accommodate that at this point in time. And I think the Minister of Health and the COVID-19 czar can both confirm that given the trajectory of our cases, that this is something that we can accommodate, as you will see with us going forward. The bottom line is, ultimately, the unions have their constituents, and we're respectful of that. We're respectful of the fact that they have added significant value. The scheme that we have today is a better scheme than we had a week ago. And it is because, when I spoke last to the country on Sunday evening um, through our church service, I mentioned that the Ministry of Finance was about to meet with the unions. And quite frankly, I think that that engagement has given us a much better program than we had initially. And I want to publicly thank the members of all of the unions and the staff associations for that. I want to make it clear they have to go to their constituents still. But equally, we will go with them because we recognize that we have also the duty to explain. And it is against that background that we hope that those meetings will take place on Tuesday and on Wednesday. But if I were to be asked generally, I am proud to be a Barbadian because I believe that we still live in a country where we are able to identify what is in the best interest of the country while at the same time taking care of the individual needs of the weakest and the fairest among us together. And that is the genius of this program. Um, I'd also like to move now at this stage very quickly to the changes. As I indicated, as of today, we had 41,836 claims for unemployment benefit. And the National Insurance Scheme has, in fact, paid out already to 23,000. And those claims are not necessarily people, by the way. But this one is people. 
they have paid out to 23,735 people advances on the unemployment benefits claims to the tune so far of $26.4 million. That clearly is going forward. Um, initially, when I spoke to the country on the 20th of March, we had said that we were looking initially to support 1,500 families in the Adopt-A-Families program. That number, um, Mr. Carter is here and he can confirm that that number as of yesterday has gone closer to 2,500 families and the truth is that the government is going to have to make some adjustments because there is still a demand for some who are really still falling through the cracks. Um, and Mr. Carter can confirm that persons are asked to confirm that they're not receiving money from NIS and indeed if they're getting from welfare we do a topping up rather unless the exigencies of the household have six and eight and nine people in it and clearly then you have to have a different approach and we use welfare to help us with the additional benefits that they give out. Um, as you are aware, the government would have given an increase on all welfare benefits from the 1st of April by 40%. Um, those benefits and amounts had not been increased for decades. In addition to that, the data generally on the medical side, uh, Minister, I'd like you to talk so that you, um, I know you were up from 5 o'clock this morning speaking at the WHO in Geneva and I want to commend you on an excellent presentation that brought um, honor to our country. I've had a number of, 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 of communications telling me how great you were and that they may well want to adopt your slogan of no surrender, no retreat. Please. Thank you, Prime Minister. Good evening, everyone. I'm happy to say that um, in the Ministry of Health and Wellness that we are satisfied that we have been able to contain the spread of COVID-19 in Barbados. Satisfied, but not complacent. Satisfied, but not arrogant. Satisfied, but not being reckless. I think the key here for us is to recognize the fact that COVID-19 is going to be with us for a while, whether or not a vaccine is discovered, and that we have to be able to live with this pandemic. I want to say to all Barbadians that a lockdown on its own will not stop the spread of COVID in a similar fashion the reopening of the country to economic activity on its own will not cause a spike. What we have to be able to do, the glue that holds this thing together, is the strict adherence to public health protocols. That is what it's going to take us through. Um, we have to be cognizant of what is happening around us, be our brother's keeper, ensure that we do everything possible within our households, within our communities, within places of worship, business places, public spaces, if we continue to do the right things, I am satisfied that based on what we are seeing here in Barbados at this point in time, that we will be able to live relatively comfortably in this new normal that we are facing. And so I urge everyone even though there may be some relaxation. And, and the fact is that we have to have some economic activity because the, the very healthcare system itself will collapse if we do not have this activity. And this is beyond and outside COVID because remember, we still have a healthcare system to manage. We still have a high quality healthcare service to deliver to the Barbadian public. But it is up to each and every one of us to do our part, to play our part, in adhering to the protocols, sanitizing our hands and sanitizing surfaces, personal hygiene, maintaining our distance, and just being smart so that we can overcome these challenges together. That, those are the things that I would want to share at this time, Prime Minister. Thank you very much, um, Minister Bostic. And I think that it is fair to say that the numbers today are zero again, if you want to. Zero? Oh, we tested about 166, I believe, today, and uh, 
there have been no positives. We've been able to contain some situations that were troubling, and I'm happy to say that I think we're on top of this. We've been expanding the testing. We've passed the 5,000 mark at this point in time. There's only one other CARICOM country that has tested more than Barbados, and that's Jamaica. And uh, we are going to expand, continue to expand, because the more we are able to test, the more we are able to see exactly what is out there. And if we discover that there are any cases, we will continue to do what we've been doing, isolate, treat, contact tracing, and contain. And I'm happy to say that even now, even if we were to get cases, now we are better prepared as a country to face with anything that comes our way than we were before we had the very first case. And I think that that is critical. Thank you. Um, and that is very well said, Jeffrey. In fact, our testing is now at just over 1.7 percent of our population, which is more than most countries. So even just to use absolute numbers with Jamaica doesn't give you context. Um, but the government has been adamant that we must continue to purchase the testing kits and the reagents and all of the things that will allow us to be fully um, ready for it. I'd like to ask the AG um, to address the areas that will open up as of Monday for me, um, and then after him to ask the czar if you would wish to have any words before it comes back to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Good evening, everyone. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to say that as we have moved from uh, limited opening uh, and then more and more relaxed uh, arrangements, uh, we have actually subjected our decision making to a higher level of rigor at each stage. Because obviously, as we, as we open up more, there's the perception, if not necessarily the risk, of, of increased spread. So before we relax even further, uh, we have a multi-tiered process. Um, and at every stage, uh, the, the health department um, and all of his officers and also the, the other agencies we're in and help to inform and guide, the, guide this decision-making process. And then, of course, finally it gets um, channeled up to a cabinet subcommittee. And, and, and yes, we've also, part of that rigorous process includes labor and the private sector, and they've been doing a marvelous job in this effort. Um, so where are we today? The Prime Minister has indicated that we're going to extend the, the hours so that, um, and just to repeat, from Monday to Thursday, uh, the shutdown hour for Barbados will be 10 o'clock at night, and we reopen at 5 in the morning. Uh, and from Friday through Sunday, the shutdown hour is 8 o'clock until, and then of course we reopen at 5 in the morning again. And um, you will probably wonder at the rationale behind this. We want to continue to suppress the natural exuberance of Barbadians for the normal weekend festivities. So even though it may appear counterintuitive uh, that we should have longer time earlier in the week and, uh, and a shorter time on weekends, it is precisely because we understand that Barbadians will want to take advantage of it and, and we still have to, have to keep some measure of control. In terms of specifics, uh, let me say that over the last few weeks, we have gradually allowed more and more retail operators to open. At this point, there are very few retail operators that are still remaining closed. And therefore, having gone through that rigorous process, various committees, we are now uh, at the point where we believe that we can reopen all, retail, all remaining retail operators. So with effect from, from Monday, all of the remaining retail operators in Barbados will be allowed to open. Let me reinforce, though, the words of the Minister of Health that these are not unconditional reopenings. These openings are subject to the strict compliance with the various protocols that are established. Uh, in some instances, enterprises will have to, to use temperature, measure, temperature measurement devices. Uh, uh, there will have to be some kind of screening. 
uh, various entities are, are going to be subjected to uh, more or less rigorous protocols in relation to distancing and so on. But at every step of the way, uh, Barbadians and the business owners are going to be expected to comply. Uh, we have developed a series of, of no generic protocols. Obviously, some kinds of retail operators will differ. Um, so the protocols for a retail operator who is selling makeup and intimate apparel will obviously be different to somebody who is selling shoes and, uh, and overalls. But effective on Monday, all remaining retail operators will be allowed to reopen. In addition to that, there are a number of service sectors that have been asking for, for the opportunity to reopen and having considered the risk, uh, we've agreed now to allow the, the functioning of the following. Photo studios and photographers, real estate agents, car rental companies, animal grooming and handling, so horses, dogs, things of that sort. Trucking and other transport of goods. Storage, car valet services, well cleaning and recycling businesses. Now, perhaps the most important of the, of the things that we're allowing to reopen will come now. Uh, the decision has been taken that effective on Monday Churches and other faith-based organizations will be allowed to conduct services. The previous regime required you to be streaming and you were only allowed to have people there for that purpose. Uh, that requirement is now, is now uh, put to bed. Uh, so it's churches and other faith-based organizations will be allowed to conduct services. Perhaps the most important of those protocols though is the density protocol and um, we are allowing we are allowing them to open only on the basis that they can allocate to each person in the sanctuary uh, 40 square feet per person this is now the recognized international standard um, so in terms of your presence in that church each congregation will only be allowed to function if they can guarantee a minimum of 40 square feet per person. So that if your, if your floor area in your sanctuary is 2,000 square feet, um, you can have a maximum of 50 worshipers in attendance. Um, there are a number of other protocols, too, perhaps too long for me to mention, but um, attendance registers have to be taken to facilitate contact tracing if necessary. Uh, uh, individuals of, of higher of the, the temp I don't remember what the temperature requirement is, but if you exceed that, uh, you're not permitted to worship. So there's a there's a there's in fact going to be a special directive dealing specifically with churches because the the requirements that we're going to subject churches to are going to be heavier than usual. Um, restaurants, we're also going to be allowing restaurants now to open for dining in. You'll remember that under the current regime, it is pickup only or delivery. Uh, but we, are now, we now feel that we're at the place where we can allow uh, reopening to take place for the purposes of dining in. Those specific densities are, are still going to be finalized. We are engaged in consultations. Um, but there are some things that are obvious. So family, if you are in a family, you will, you will not be subject to the physical distancing protocol of, of being six feet apart because you are in the same household. Um, but we have to be fairly careful in terms of the distances between the tables and, 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 and non-related patrons. Uh, so those details are being fine-tuned, but we would certainly expect to be able to complete those um, by tomorrow. From Tuesday, so we skip the bank holiday Monday. From Tuesday, we skip the bank holiday Monday. We skip the bank holiday on Monday. So from Tuesday, um, we will lift any restrictions on beaches other than an opening time of 5 a.m. and a closing time of 6.30, subject to physical distancing. So on Monday, bank holiday, when Barbadians want to picnic, no, you cannot picnic. 
You cannot picnic. Um, in fact, you can't picnic even after Monday. But the point is that from Tuesday, uh, beaches will be allowed to open from 5 in the morning until 6.30 in the evening. And all of the same physical distancing protocols will obtain. Uh, no groups of more than three, unless you are a family, and distancing of at least six feet. Uh, those things will still obtain. In as much as we're opening beaches, there's good sense in allowing parks to open. And therefore, all public parks in Barbados will open now on the usual hours, whatever they are, whether it's Farley Hill or Queen's Park. Um, but the botanical gardens as well, um, Andromeda Gardens, Hunts, Hunts Gardens, Flower Forest, all of those places are going to be allowed to be open, uh, subject to the same physical distancing requirements. Uh, the Prime Minister has mentioned, and I'll end on this point, the importance of uh, engaging in significant consultative meetings going forward. And the current practice is that in every instance we've had to grant an exemption, such as for this meeting today. Uh, that is proven to be impractical. And of course, as the Prime Minister has indicated, in order to be able to facilitate the decision making over the next two weeks or so, we are going to have to have larger gatherings um, subject to, of course, again, those same physical distancing protocols. So going forward, um, you will, you will notice a significant number of larger meetings, uh, but we feel that this is going to be important in order to help us through this process. Uh, those are the basic decisions of the, the various committees. Um, there's been some interest in sport, and we're fine-tuning that. Uh, you know that we've already got a, a fair amount of level one sporting activity. Uh, a number of requests have come in. Um, and that is still under consideration. Uh, it is not likely, though, that we will move to a higher stage of sports in time for Monday, um, simply because there, there are so many different kinds of sporting activity, and many of them, uh, as long as you allow more than one person to participate, there's a risk of, of people running into each other and so on. Uh, with that, thank you very much, Prime Minister. Thank you, AG. May I say that there's a genuine capacity issue, and we take these things for granted as a small state. Um, the decision to open up or not to open up sectors is subject to uh, analysis by the public health and the um, environmental health officials, and as I said, consulting with the labor movement and with the private sector. And there's only so much that can be done at one time while doing everything else that we have to do. So we accept that the heavy lifting on the second round with sports will come very shortly. Um, we accept, and they're still doing the heavy lifting as we speak on day daycare facilities, because that is not as straightforward as you might otherwise think. And similarly, the real elephant in the room is going to be on accommodation and um, the hotel sector in particular. Some of you may have seen me speak on the BBC earlier this week when I was trying, the gentleman tried to force me to a specific date and I made the point that Barbados is not working to a date. Barbados is working to an environment where it's hotel workers, it's hotel visitors, and generally the country can be safe. Uh, as soon as we are satisfied that we have that, then we are in a position to start to see how we can work. Bottom line is, COVID is with us. We agree and we hope that there will be life after COVID, whether it comes through a vaccine or a therapeutic, but we are not yet there. And to that extent, we have to see how we can modify and benefit from it. Um, Mr. Carter, I put in those words only because it's to give you a point to lift off and to remind the others that he, this is, I have two anchors, Minister Bostic and Mr. Carter. Uh, they're the ones acting as ballast to the ship of state, trying to hold us down while we move forward. But I'm satisfied that their work thus far has been of such a high quality that all Barbadians can feel safe that we have missed the majority of the bullet, even though it is regrettable that seven persons have passed from us and 92 persons have had the virus from day one. Mr. Carter. Thank you, Prime Minister. Yes, I have become somewhat of the Grinch for COVID-19. 
um, constantly harping on the restrictions and reminding people of the need to adhere to them. Um, but let me say that these restrictions are protective and not punitive. They are guaranteed or they are designed to ensure that we are each of us able to understand and to live in and to enjoy the life that the God has given us. And the data have shown, as the Minister of Health has indicated, that we have been successful thus far as a consequence of the restrictions and the, ad the adherence thereof to maintaining a level of um, containment over COVID-19 in Barbados. So for the entire month of May, we have registered just 11 confirmed cases of COVID-19. And in fact, since the last directive was issued on the 17th, we've registered just four cases, two of which were imported. So we've only had two cases of local transmission. And as was indicated, this is not because we are not testing, because as of yesterday, we conducted 5,201 tests for COVID-19, over 2,800 since the beginning of May alone. We are testing. We have now just nine persons in isolation. And this is the first time we've been in single digits in terms of live cases since March. So what we've been doing has been working, and the numbers are demonstrating it. Um, I am happy that we've been able to come to a point where we've been able to gradually relax the restrictions. But every time I speak about this, I constantly remind persons that the relaxation is only in so far as there is general compliance with the, re with the restrictions that are in place. And I would like um, to thank Barbadians generally for the compliance that they have had, um, demonstrated in relation to the restrictions that have been put in place. It is because of the general compliance that we are at the stage that we have been. I had uh, cause to speak specifically to a particular segment of the Barbadian population or uh, the Muslim community because of the peculiarity of the celebration of Ramadan and the observance of which normally, just like our Easter, would have had large numbers of persons in observance. And thankfully, I was able, because I went out and looked for myself, to see that that compliance was, generally speaking, adhered to. There were no large numbers. In fact, a number of the mosques were closed. There were no large numbers in the cemeteries, as there customarily is. And therefore, I would like to use this opportunity to thank the Muslim community and the broader community of Barbados for their compliance with the directives that have been put in place. And we look forward to realizing the only number that is important. I know there's a fascination in the uh, community with numbers. The only number that is important, and that is zero. We look forward to realizing that number in the next coming months. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Carter. And um, we're open for any questions. Uh, we are going to share the a document with you. Not that one, but the other one, um, Kevin. And I'm told that there is an earlier version of these documents going around um, before we were able to perfect it. And I'd like those people who have it to disregard it. That's why this form of document, put it up for me, please, is completely different. Um, we'll have a graphics version of it, but the media, I'm sure, just wants the Word version to make their life easier. I've sent a copy of it to my press secretary, and he will distribute it to everybody. And it has not only, let's go to the top, please, not only the um, things, but it also has the frequently asked questions that came out of our meetings with the unions so that people will be able to, to have it. In other words, what is a bond? How does it work? Da, 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 et cetera. Um, so you'll get that, okay? Uh, I ignore the one that was going around before, please. Like with most things in this third decade of the 21st century, everything finds a way, even as a work in progress. Any questions? Yes, Barry. But you want to use the mics because then remember you're being broadcast. Uh, good evening. Question for the Attorney General. Uh, should we assume 
that from Tuesday the alphabet shopping system will be completely discontinued now? Uh, I apologize. The alphabet system is now suspended. Um, uh, but the warning, of course, is that if the situation becomes out of control and if Barbadians are irresponsible, uh, we will go back to it. But we feel, so it's not a case that we feel that it, is, that it has, has outlived its usefulness, but we feel that the, the responsible side of Barbadians that we've seen um, and also given that we're extending the hours and, and so on will allow a much, lar a much longer period for Barbadians to access businesses and so on. So at this point in time, it appears to be less necessary. So uh, please, we have to be fairly careful in terms of the distances between the tables and, 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 and non-related patrons. Uh, so those details are being fine-tuned, but we would certainly expect to be able to complete those um, by tomorrow. From Tuesday, so we skip the bank holiday Monday. From Tuesday, we skip the bank holiday Monday. We skip the bank holiday on Monday. So from Tuesday, um, we will lift any restrictions on beaches other than an opening time of 5 a.m. and a closing time of 6:30, subject to physical distancing. So on Monday, by holiday, when Barbadians want to picnic, no, you cannot picnic. You cannot picnic. Um, in fact, you can't picnic even after Monday. But the point is that from Tuesday, uh, beaches will be allowed to open from 5 in the morning until 6.30 in the evening. And all of the same physical distancing protocols will obtain. Uh, no groups of more than three, unless you are a family, and distancing of at least six feet, uh, those things will still obtain. In as much as we're opening beaches, there's good sense in allowing parks to open, and therefore all public parks in Barbados will open now on the usual hours, whatever they are, whether it's Farley Hill or Queen's Park. Um, but the Botanical Gardens as well, um, Andromeda Gardens, Hunts, Hunts Gardens, Flower Forest, all of those places are going to be allowed to be open, uh, subject to the same physical distancing requirements. Uh, the Prime Minister has mentioned, and I'll end on this point, the importance of uh, engaging in significant consultative meetings going forward. And the current practice is that in every instance we've had to grant an exemption, such as for this meeting today. Uh, that is proven to be impractical. And of course, as the Prime Minister has indicated, in order to be able to facilitate the decision making over the next two weeks or so, we are going to have to have larger gatherings um, subject to, of course, again, those same physical distancing protocols. So going forward, um, you will you will notice a significant number of larger meetings, uh, but we feel that this is going to be important in order to help us through this process. Uh, those are the basic decisions of the the various committees. Um, there's been some interest in sport, and we are fine tuning that. Uh, you know that we've already got a, a fair amount of level one sporting activity. Uh, a number of requests have come in. Um, and that is still under consideration. Uh, it is not likely, though, that we will move to a higher stage of sports in time from Monday, um, simply because there, there's so many different kinds of sporting activity, and many of them, uh, as long as you allow more than one person to participate, there's a risk of, of people running into each other and so on. Uh, with that, thank you very much, Prime Minister. Thank you, AG. May I say that there's a genuine capacity issue, and we take these things for granted as a small state. Um, the decision to open up or not to open up sectors is subject to uh, analysis by the public health and the um, environmental health officials, and as I said, consulting with the labor movement and with the private sector. And there's only so much that can be done at one time while doing everything else that we have to do. So we accept that the heavy lifting on the second round with sports will come very shortly. 
Um, we accept, and they're still doing the heavy lifting as we speak on day daycare facilities, because that is not as straightforward as you might otherwise think. And similarly, the real elephant in the room is going to be on accommodation and um, the hotel sector in particular. Some of you may have seen me speak on the BBC earlier this week when I was trying, the gentleman tried to force me to a specific date and I made the point that Barbados is not working to a date. Barbados is working to an environment where it's hotel workers, it's hotel visitors, and generally the country can be safe. Uh, as soon as we are satisfied that we have that, then we are in a position to start to see how we can work. Bottom line is, COVID is with us. We agree and we hope that there will be life after COVID, whether it comes through a vaccine or a therapeutic, but we are not yet there. And to that extent, we have to see how we can modify and benefit from it. Um, Mr. Carter, I put in those words only because it's to give you a point to lift off and to remind the others that he, this is, I have two anchors, Minister Bostic and Mr. Carter. Uh, they're the ones acting as ballast to the ship of state, trying to hold us down while we move forward. But I'm satisfied that their work thus far has been of such a high quality that all Barbadians can feel safe that we have missed the majority of the bullet, even though it is regrettable that seven persons have passed from us and 92 persons have had the virus from day one. Mr. Carter. Thank you, Prime Minister. Yes, I have become somewhat of the Grinch for COVID-19, um, constantly harping on the restrictions and reminding people of the need to adhere to them. Um, but let me say that these restrictions are protective and not punitive. They are guaranteed or they're designed to ensure that we are each of us able to understand and to live in and to enjoy the life that the God has given us. And the data have shown, as the Minister of Health has indicated, that we have been successful thus far as a consequence of the restrictions and the, ad the adherence thereof to maintaining a level of um, containment over COVID-19 in Barbados. So for the entire month of May, we have registered just 11 confirmed cases of COVID-19. And in fact, since the last directive was issued on the 17th, we've registered just four cases, two of which were imported. So we've only had two cases of local transmission. And as was indicated, this is not because we are not testing, because as of yesterday, we'd conducted 5,201 tests for COVID-19, over 2,800 since the beginning of May alone. We are testing. We have now just nine persons in isolation. And this is the first time we've been in single digits in terms of live cases since March. So what we've been doing has been working and the numbers are demonstrating it. Um, I am happy that we've been able to come to a point where we've been able to gradually relax the restrictions. But every time I speak about this, I constantly remind persons that the relaxation is only in so far as there is general compliance with the, re with the restrictions that are in place. And I would like um, to thank Barbadians generally for the compliance that they have had, um, demonstrated in relation to the restrictions that have been put in place. It is because of the general compliance that we are at the stage that we have been. I had uh, calls to speak specifically to a particular segment of the Barbadian population or uh, the Muslim community because of the peculiarity of the celebration of Ramadan and the observance of which normally, just like our Easter, would have had large numbers of persons in observance. And thankfully, I was able, because I went out and looked for myself, to see that that compliance was, generally speaking, adhered to. There were no large numbers. In fact, a number of the mosques were closed. There were no large numbers in the cemeteries, as there customarily is. And therefore, I would like to use this opportunity to thank the Muslim community and the broader community of Barbados for their compliance with the directives that have been put in place. And we look forward to 
realizing the only number that is important, I know there's a fascination in the uh, community with numbers, the only number that is important and that is zero. We look forward to realizing that number in the next coming months. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Carter. And um, we're open for any questions. Uh, we are going to share the a document with you, not that one, but the other one, um, Kevin. And I'm told that there is an earlier version of these documents going around um, before we were able to perfect it. And I'd like those people who have it to disregard it. That's why this form of document, put it up for me please, is completely different. Um, we'll have a graphics version of it, but the media I'm sure just wants the word version to make their life easier. I've sent a copy of it to my press secretary and he will distribute it to everybody. And it has not only, let's go to the top please, not only the um, things, but it also has the frequently asked questions that came out of our meetings with the unions so that people will be able to, to have it. In other words, what is a bond? How does it work? Da, 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 et cetera. Um, so you'll get that, okay? Uh, ignore the one that was going around before, please. Like with most things in this third decade of the 21st century, everything finds a way, even as a work in progress. Any questions? Yes, Barry. But you want to use the mics because then remember you're being broadcast. Uh, good evening. Question for the Attorney General. Uh, should we assume that from Tuesday the alphabet shopping system will be completely discontinued now? Uh, I apologize. The alphabet system is now suspended. Um, uh, but the warning, of course, is that if the situation becomes out of control and if Barbadians are irresponsible, uh, we will go back to it. But we feel, so it's not a case that we feel that it has, that it has, has outlived its usefulness, but we feel that the, the responsible side of Barbadians that we've seen, um, and also given that we're extending the hours and, and so on will allow a much, lar a much longer period for Barbadians to access businesses and so on. So at this point in time, it appears to be less necessary. So uh, please note that the alphabet system is now suspended for the time being. And to follow that, um, in the hospitality sector, the restaurant business is usually part of a combination of bar and restaurants, <laughs> no but bars. no mention of bars was made, so no I just bars. want a clarification, um, no bars. A restaurant that has, a restaurant that has, that will serve drinks. Um, while serving dinner. You know, well, well, for to diners is not an issue, but uh, we will not be opening standalone bars at this point in time or restaurants for the purpose of people coming in to socialize at a bar and have a few drinks and then go off to someplace else. I think the, the nature of the risk in that instance is obvious to most. Thank you. Ask Barbadians to be patient. Um, I, I don't know how I'm gonna get through this July because I am a crop over baby if ever there was one. And um, I see Delta nodding because she knows. Uh, so, I mean, I could miss Smokey this year too. But the truth is, we are trying to see what we can do to still have music and things for persons to enjoy in their homes. There have been a lot of virtual concerts, and I want to thank the artists for it. And um, yes, tell Mr. Ratley that I did watch Bounty and Beanie. <laughs> uh, yes, it was great. <laughs> yes, it was the Bob. And there may even be a record of me commenting during, during it. Um, but I want us to be patient. In life, what matters, as Mr. Carter said, is how we protect the life that God has given us. And we're going to get there. But we need to do it. And when the AG talked about the weekends staying at 8 p.m. to, 4, to 5 a.m. being counterintuitive, the truth is we're taking our chance first on the rest of retail. 
and the density of people moving around is going to increase significantly. We need to take it first for people's livelihoods before we take it for people's desire for entertainment. And that's all we're asking people is to work with us. These two week things have gone well. Um, and once we see that we have gained ground, we can go again and open up a little more. There are people who are texting, um, even as this meeting has been going on, saying, what about squash? What about um, road tennis? Well, road tennis is already in. Um, some of the other sports, we're gonna get there. But we have a limited amount of people with the requisite skills to do the work. And we can't expect miracles overnight, but we'll get there. Yes, sir. Hi, good evening. This question is for the AG. Um, I know you spoke about the extension of the hours. I still need some clarification, though, as relates to the freedom um, for Barbadians to, to walk around and, and to do their business. You know, I, I've, um, I've tried to explain this in every possible way, so I've now, I think I now have a good example. Um, and all the parents among us would hopefully understand it. If you tell your child that you are, you, are, you are banished to your room, you cannot leave your room at all, that child will still have to leave his room to go to the loop, to grab a shower, um, to do, maybe even to eat. But the point is, that does not mean that he is any less under punishment or any, any less under restriction to his room. There are some overriding principles about this COVID directive that I think people are choosing to ignore. Principle number one is, unless you are an essential worker, you must stay at home. That's, that's the opening gambit, that's where we begin. All right, so you are banished to your home, to put it in that way. However, just like the child who has to go to the bathroom and get a shower and so on, we understand that Barbadians have to have an opportunity to, to buy food, they have to have an opportunity to go to the pharmacist, to go to the doctor, to do a wide range of things. And over time, we have, we have extended that range of things. But this weekend, there were some motorcyclists who came, to, who went before the court. Now, they were um, doing whatever, their wheelies or whatever it is in the Lairs area. There's nothing in the directive that says you can go to Lairs or go anywhere and, and mess around with your motorcycle. So obviously, they were operating in breach of that principle that underpins this entire thing. So when we talk about freedom and freedom to move, it is limited. You are only allowed to be outside of your premises for the purposes of doing those things that are permitted. But you have now permitted many, many, many things. I mean, and we certainly that's, have. And that's what I think may be causing the confusion for the journalists. Uh, uh, yeah, but, but so we, we've permitted more things. But the point is uh, that you are still only allowed to go out if you're going to be doing those things. Now, I suppose it's human nature. You, you, you decide you, you're going to the supermarket, but then you can go and do something else that might not necessarily be, be included in the directive. But the principle is that so as to avoid the spread of COVID, we need to eliminate or to reduce significantly human to human contact. So you start out by staying at home 24 hours. That's why it's a 24 hour curfew. But we have given the opportunity to go and do things, things that are required for your day to day existence. So to that extent, you are at liberty to move around the country, but only to that extent. Okay. I have one question for, Mr. for Dr. Greenwich. Um, do you think that um, government will garner enough interest in the BOSS program um, to reach government's targets? Sorry, can you just repeat it quickly? Do you think that government will garner enough interest um, in the BOSS program 
to reach the, the, your, the target? Yes, and by design, we will reach the targets. The reason being that every worker, I repeat, is going to get his or her salary. Every worker will also receive their salary in cash and a bond. But at that immediate time, the worker can choose, before they receive, before actually receive in hand, they can choose to convert it into cash and have it done very, even for their paycheck and they will see it in their bank account. But behind the scenes, even though worker X says, listen, you got $4,500 for me. I know I'm getting $4,000 in cash and $500 in bond. Worker X says that. Don't give me the bond, give me my $500. So I want $4,500 in my bank account on payday. You hear me? Good. Behind the scenes, watch me, behind the scenes, the government still issues cash for $4,000 and a bond for $500. And converts that bond into cash and gives the worker his $4,500. But on my fiscal accounts, I require 4,000 in cash, the 500 are bond. So the 500 space, I still use. So that's why it's so nice, because I achieve your objective by still giving the worker the choice of what he wants. Because that 500 bond, now, even though he gets cash, that goes up now to the central bank in the market, and somebody else is going to take it up and benefit from those savings. So I achieve the objective, even though. But more importantly than that, given the attractiveness of interest rates, I we expect the demand for these bonds is going to be very high. Unless my our gut feeling is that unless a worker really needs his cash, he's going to leave it in bonds because there's nothing more attractive out there to put it in. Let me contextualize it. Um, the interest rate that the government is offering is is very attractive, but it is not unusual for us to borrow and to get. Um, the money that we are paying for at that same price. So the Caribbean Development Bank lends the government money at four and a half percent, four and three quarters percent. Um, sometimes we're paying for money at five and a half and six percent or other capital projects. So if we pay five percent to Bajans, instead of paying five percent to a credit union somewhere in Iowa, or an insurance company somewhere in Manitoba, why shouldn't they give the Bajans the opportunity to be able to borrow, um, to, to benefit, sorry, from that bond at that instead of getting 0 0.1 and 0.01% in the bank? Okay, so it's a win-win for the saver, but it's a win-win for the government because what we're doing is not only accessing the capital at an affordable rate, but we are also creating an opportunity for our citizens to be the ones getting the benefit of the money, that, the interest that we are going to pay instead of people that we don't know. And I'll make this last point. Minister Strawn met yesterday with the credit union movement in order to be able to explain and to give them a sense and they're going back to their boards. But I think that everybody who understands this program recognizes the win-win in it for everybody because the credit unions now keep their money in the bank. What interest are they getting in the bank? 0 0.1, 0 0.01. They might have some fixed deposits at a higher amount. But the 5% all of a sudden is much better than anything else. And if I, as a public sector worker, want my cash because I got some issues that I already have to pay for. In fact, I got six more months or seven more months of this particular bill at court, so wherever that I got to pay for. I may say I can take up this from month eight, but I got seven first months. I need that extra $500 to pay down on a, 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 a thing that I take out. You can then decide, and if I were me, I would be saying, let my credit union buy my particular bond. Because when my credit union buys my bond, then my credit union is earning more. And then I can ultimately get what? When the credit union earns more and makes more profits, who benefits? The members. Because the members are what? Shareholders. So that it is in my interest that if I'm not taking the bond and I want to get the cash, I would like my credit union, unless you have somebody else in your family who got savings down and 
who you want to, to assign to be the person because you can assign a specific person. And don't feel confused tonight. You're going to hear so much about this that you're going to feel really tired hearing about it now. So don't believe you're going to hear everything tonight and retain everything tonight because it doesn't work that way and we accept that. So we're going to be coming and repeating and putting the information. You're going to get the document this evening. There's a document in black and white. Um, there are other questions that will come up as we go through the next few days, and we understand that. And it's no sweat, no problem. Uh, Prime Minister, Sorry. if you could put on your chairman of CARICOM hat for a second. You've spoken about numerous conversations you've had with your Prime Ministerial colleagues. Uh, are they as patient as you, or are they expressing a greater level of urgency when it comes to the eventual opening of their hospitality sectors? You seem to be going at a pretty patient race, but, rate, but are they as patient as you, or are their urgencies at a different level than yours? I don't know that I can comment in terms of their patients or my patients. I think that we've all agreed, first and foremost, that we want to do this safely. Um, there may be one or two who may decide as an outlier to go a little earlier than the others. I'm not sure that there is a lot of merit in being the first in this one. I prefer to have the merit in being the safest. And to that extent, therefore, we are being very sure-footed about it. Believe you me, there's a cost. There is a cost. But I think that the kind of social compact that we have in Barbados is that these things matter, people matter, social justice matters. The most famous statement in Barbados in a village is, well, could there, because we care about people, and it's that sense of empathy. So I think that if we understand that, you understand that so long as we feel, the first thing that has to happen to open up the hospitality sector is that you've got to engage your hotel workers, which means engaging the unions. And we have to understand that at the end of the day, a hospitality sector is driven not just by tourists coming, it's also driven by people working. It's also driven by hotel owners owning. In some instances, some hotel owners have chosen to do refurbishments. I've seen some pictures going around with some people who started refurbishment of their properties and said, look, we can just take the time and refurbish. There are others who are saying, particularly the larger ones that may act as an enclave, we feel we can make it. And we've been having conversations with the airlines. We've been having conversations with the cruise lines. But we accept that we have to have the protocols. And the airlines have rolled out for us what they're going to do to sanitize the planes and how much cleaner it's going to be and everything. And it's wonderful. At the end of the day, we're looking at testing. And the Minister of Health will tell you that we also, even if we want to get into regional travel going, we're going to have to agree, for example, that there's no sense in testing on both sides of a flight. If you come in from Trinidad here, or you come in from St. Lucia here, or Jamaica here, why are you testing on both sides? We need, because we have the same common public health protocols, and in fact, CARFA, Caribbean Public Health Agency, is supporting us. So um, I deliberately put it on the table tonight, not because it's finished, but because it's the next set of heavy lifting over the next two to three weeks that we're doing. And it's not that we're being patient, but I'd like to believe that we're being careful and safe. And to follow up to that, we've heard the Minister and the Tsar speak in terms of success with containment and mitigation. So in the back of your mind, is there a particular time frame that you're thinking about yet? Even if you won't be pegged down on a date? I think interregional travel, is probably the easiest to start, but having said that, you're going to find that Canada may well be the country of, of, of the traditional countries that we have that may well be the safest for us to open up because I think the Minister of Health will tell you that the risk is considerably less as compared to the US and the UK at the moment. The other problem is, is that these countries have also put quarantines just like us on other ends. So once you start to see the quarantines moving, um, that would be the first sign of it. In some instances, we recognize and that villa, long stay, remember a couple weeks ago I talked about long stay visitors, people who are students, people who um, are coming 
back, they live in the diaspora, but they can come home for two months, three months. So those kind of people in the initial stages will not mind quarantining provisions, even if it is self-quarantining um, at home. But others who are coming for five days, it doesn't make sense for them. And equally, if they have to go back to the UK, as Prime Minister Johnson announced, um, I think it was about two weeks ago, they would have to go back into a 14-day quarantine. It doesn't make sense for them either. So tourism for the next two to three months, is, is it may open up, but it is going to be not in full throttle, largely because you have to coordinate at the governmental level, what are the quarantine arrangements, what are the screening arrangements, and we hope by then to get more rapid tests, because rapid tests is really, in my view, what will open up the air travel um, fully again. Uh, when I say fully, I don't mean at necessarily 100%, because the airlines are probably starting at 60% of plane load in terms of density to start, but I don't think they'll hold on to that for long, quite frankly, listening to them. Thank you. And last question for the Attorney General. Uh, Barbados still has a very high level of gym membership. I noticed you didn't mention gyms earlier. Uh, are they still under heavy consideration as well? Everything is under heavy consideration, but at this point in time, uh, we don't. We are not able to allow gyms to open. I'm afraid. Um, so that is going to be deferred for further and future consideration. And while I have the floor, and before I allow the next question, I've, I've got about 20 messages in the last two minutes. The alphabet system is not suspended from tomorrow. It's suspended from Monday, from Monday, okay? So please do not rush everywhere tomorrow. It is suspended. And all of these things that we are talking about are with effect from Monday, except for the beaches, and parks, which is from, from Tuesday. So as of Monday next week, no hard, no alphabet for hardware, supermarket, banks, no alphabet. No alphabet for bakeries, no alphabet. I'm sorry, go ahead. No problem. Um, this question is for the Attorney General and the Czar. Um, with the alphabet system. Well, but before you do it, let me ask the Attorney General a question. And the question has to be, last time I checked, Sherman does not have a lot of beds. And I don't know the last time I sleep on a ground on a carpet. So could you please exempt all of us who are in this building? I don't have a pass either. Could you please exempt all of us in this building um, until 9.15, such that we can go home? <laughs> that was done at about 10 to 8, Prime Minister. The Lord bless you. Yes, sirs. Um, the lines have been long since the last directive where everyone with a certain name can shop for the full day. With you ending the alphabet system, um, do you think that the lines will be even longer? Because with persons going to work now, as in the retail, more retail businesses opening, there will be less hours, well, shorter time frame to shop or to conduct bank business. Do you think the lines would be longer? And have you taken into consideration like the clash? Can you repeat the last bit? Taking into consideration the... The lines have been long. No, this is the very last word that I missed. Taking into consideration the... The clash. The clash. We, we have not seen um, very long lines in the, last, um, in the last month or so since we have put the alphabet system in place. Since that initial burst, I think the lines have actually regularized themselves and we've been seeing much shorter lines. And in fact, some of the retail businesses like supermarkets and so on have been themselves complaining um, in relation to their business. Um, we have seen long lines at banks and at credit unions. And I remind Barbadians all the time that seeing long lines is, in some respects, a positive thing because it represents the fact that people are observing the physical distancing. If you have 50 people who are maintaining a, di a distance of six feet, that is 300 feet. That line will extend for 100 meters. And therefore, it means that people are observing the requirements of physical distancing. Now, I do not 
expect or anticipate that we are going to see any much longer lines with the relaxation of the alphabet system because it means that people will now be able to shop when it is most convenient to them. In fact, we are almost going back to where we were pre-COVID in terms of people's shopping uh, preferences and shopping, uh, shopping practices. So I am not anticipating any greater or longer lines as a consequence of the relaxation of the alphabet system. Attorney General wants to say anything? Uh, no, I'm happy with the SARS answer and I concur with them 100%, except to say that if, as always, if the system um, spirals out of control and it's necessary to dampen uh, those practices again, we will if necessary. Thank you. Okay, I think that um, having received permission to be out to 915, there's some people who live far and there's some people who ought not to stop anywhere, so I want to make sure that they can drive slowly and not break the law. Um, I think that members of the media know that we've been engaging with you regularly, so you'll get a chance, anyone who has additional questions. Um, suffice it to say that all Tuesday and all Wednesday, I expect to be in sessions with public sector workers, um, answering questions, and we're making available um, the economic team to, and Dr. Greenwich in particular to, um, I want to thank the governor too because uh, although he's out there, he I believe was on calls late last night mm -hmm. on Zoom too with Dr. Greenwich and making sure that we can get the message out. There is no shortcut to communication and don't feel any way, there is no foolish question, there is no foolish concept. And we've proven in this exercise that working together, we're not yet there. Um, the unions have to formally go to their membership, but we've shown that in listening to each other and in working together, that that is when Barbados performs the best, always together. With respect to the public service, um, flexi work and telework will still continue. But there will be some government offices, for example, like town planning that was not open, that will now be open. And a lot of the other public available services will be open in servicing the government's business. But we are still trying to keep the density down on the roads, hence the commitment to flexi work and telework where possible still. But bringing in public servants one to two days where they are doing that homework so that they don't forget what the office looks like. Um, with that, I'd like to thank everybody, and in particular, and to say that we didn't choose to be in this time. It is what it is, but I know together um, we shall make it. Thank you, and get home safely, please. If anybody has problems getting home, all jokes aside, um, please, there are enough chats. I think there's a chat for us with the social partnership. Please let us know so that we can make sure that there are no problems because as much as we, the AG has given an exemption, an officer on the road might not have known when they stopped you. We will therefore verify it. Thank you very much. <laughs>